So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first session in the Startup School of Schools course. This is a course created by Tech Hub Riga together with the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia. And well, we have had already the introductory call, but there we talked about what's going to happen throughout this program. But today we have our full-fledged uh, first uh, session where, well, you will have to have the opportunity to hopefully learn something new, something you will be able to use uh, going forward forward in order to develop your startup even further. My name is Paul Silinch and I'm the one who's going to be running this program. I'm going to be with you throughout all of these sessions. I'm going to be with you on Slack as well and uh, we will be able also able to be to communicate via emails as well if you want to. But of course Slack is the you know, a uh, quicker method and more convenient one. So uh, if talking about Slack, then if you haven't yet, I would strongly suggest you join our Slack workspace because that's the place where all the most important information is going to be posted, where I will post all of the recordings as well. That's where I will post all the tests from our uh, sessions. And yeah, it's, a, it's definitely going to be a bit easier to communicate either with me or other participants of the course right there if you want to that is but i, I would really suggest that you do so because uh, otherwise uh, via emails you will only receive the links to the upcoming sessions you won't receive the link for the pitch competition and you won't be able to fill out the tests because i'm i'm gonna post them only on slack and i have um I received a message from one of the participants that uh, she didn't receive the initial email from me, the introductory email, so to say, where there was a Slack link. And I'm guessing that's because uh, I did BCC a lot of people, and it's possible that this email ended up in your spam box. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't received it, because I did send it out, uh, please uh, write me a message uh, via email. You have received, you know, my email from the calendar links, calendar events. So yeah, please write me a message and I will send you the introductory email and the link to join the Slack workspace. And uh, yeah, uh, once more about the Slack workspace uh, tests and recordings, as I said, you will be able to find them there. Tests are going to be located in the um, tests uh, channel and the recordings are going to be located in the resources channel. So if you end up on Slack, if you look around, you will find these channels and now you know what they mean. Then again, I have posted the sort of messages there explaining what each channel does. So it shouldn't be so that difficult to understand. Um, Regarding today and all of the upcoming sessions, if you can, I would be, me and the lecturers would be really grateful if you could turn on your camera. That way we see who we are talking to. And it definitely helps out to feel that there is an audience there. And uh, yeah, so, but if you can't, that's also completely fine. I can understand that uh, for some reason the camera ain't working. Maybe you're in bed, maybe you're, I don't know, in a gym right now and listening on to this over your phone so that's completely fine uh, but if you can please turn on your camera and uh, regarding the questions we will start with the presentation part and then after that one we will have the Q&A there you will be able to ask the, our speaker our lecturer today uh, any questions you may have about the topic and uh, yeah to do so please use either the chat on zoom or uh, raise your virtual hand on Zoom, and then we will give you the floor, floor to ask the question verbally. So I guess that's that regarding the sort of technical instructions. And uh, yeah, today we will focus on market validation, how to design the validation process, how to define action based, uh, how to define action based on the validation, and how to navigate through a uh, dominated or crowded market. Those could be some of the points we will touch upon. And uh, I would say that's enough from me, and I would love to give the floor over to our mentor of today, uh, Daniel Smarthels, Product and Growth Leader, currently Chief Product Officer at DiscoverCars.com. Daniels, I would love to give the floor over to you. Hey, thanks, Paul. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so first, let me share my screen to see if everything working as intended. Uh, can you please confirm that you see? Yes, we can see it. Cool. So uh, before we jump into the content of today, uh, first of all, uh, some uh, slight correction on what Paul said. Uh, there will be a Q and A in the end, but there will be a Q and A in the in the middle because essentially the whole slide that they separated into parts. Uh, the first part is mostly on product market fit, and the second part is a bit like early stages 
of what needs to be taken into account to gain uh, traction early on. So that it's kind of part of the product market fit, but more going into like scaling part. Uh, that's about the uh, operational part. Uh, maybe quickly about myself. As uh, Paul said, I'm currently, uh, well, actually no longer a, a chief product officer of Discover Cards. We just, uh, hired. I was an intern, uh, as a temporary chief product officer for a while, uh, while I was actually looking to hire a, a person to replace myself. And we just hired uh, somebody last week before that. So I'm, I'm uh, now actually uh, can commit completely to my own company that uh, we launching in uh, beginning of December. And uh, I mean, we're launching live as a product. We already developed it for a while. Before that, I was a uh, chief product officer in a company called Printify, where I helped the company to grow from about 200,000 uh, GMV per month to about 200, uh, sorry, 20 million uh, GMV per month. So like 250, 240 million per year. And overall I have more than 15 exper years experience in different tech related role in marketing, in sales, in product development, obviously. Uh, but since uh, last five or six years, I was mostly focusing on product related roles. So product and growth related uh, roles. That's why I'm here to help you with this part of. And additionally, I'm also early stage investor and um, actually also early stage consultant or mentor for many, both Latvian, Eastern European and Baltic startups. So I know both these like scaling part, but also like very early stage and uh, product market fit part uh, of building a tech company. So yeah. <clears throat> With that being said, uh, let's maybe jump into overall what uh, what is a product life cycle because every product has uh, multiple life cycles and you need to understand where your product kind of lives right now to understand what kind of strategy, what kind of approaches are important for you as a leader or as a co-founder or maybe early employee of, the, of, of a product company. So first is obviously product market fit and this is what we're going to be talking about a lot today. Uh, this is achieving initial product needs, so uh, I'm not going to go too much it, into detail, but essentially how do you, what it means and how you achieve it is this whole point of today's uh, lecture. The second part is actually feature development. So once you achieve the product market fit and establish like the minimal set of features that uh, constitute a product, you obviously need to continue developing it. And uh, usually additional features mean additional growth, additional users. Uh, solving um, uh, for additional use cases that may have been uh, were left on the drawing board for uh, MVP or for initial plunge. So that's uh, we also will covering in a very small amount of um, content today. Uh, then uh, once you have a very established or well established product that actually have uh, a problem that it is solving and it's solving is moderately well, then you need to focus on uh, growth. And growth usually means uh, how do you drive a uh, new acquisition, how you acquire new users, then how you retain those users for a longer period of time because acquiring users is expensive. So you want to retain them so they continue generating revenue for you. And then talking about revenue, you need to figure out the model of monetization. So how do you earn money from those users? So again, we're not going to be covering a lot of it, but just a brief uh, overview later today. And once you have done, gone through the first three stages, at a at certain point, pretty much every product reaches what is called a, a product market fit ceiling or a market ceiling where in the current market with the current product, you just cannot grow anymore. So you need to do what is called product market fit expansion, meaning that you need to figure out in which adjacent verticals or sometimes even um, both horizontally or vertically, you need to expand to actually extend the ceiling so you can continue growing because for every company, especially if you're a funded one, growth is you're probably one of the utmost important things. And as one of my mentors told me, growth solves all the old problems. So while you're growing, everything is easy. If you stop growing, then the problems can arise. It doesn't mean that it's always the only solution, but pretty much it is one of the easiest solutions to be focusing on. So uh, with that being said, uh, before you can grow, you obviously need to establish the product market fit. So um, what is actually product market fit? What does it mean? So determining product market fit is a vital first step to, towards a successful go-to-market strategy, obviously. 
And uh, kind of this is a thing that, uh, especially for a very early, you probably heard uh, a lot for early stage company, early stage founders. This is kind of this nurturing thing that you need to figure out before you can do anything else. That's why this is the first lecture of the, of the series. Uh, but if you kind of break down the product market fit into like components of what does it mean? So uh, it's actually consists of the five main components. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, some of them belong into the product, some of them belong to the market. So the first is obviously is your target customers, who are you targeting, uh, who, who, for whom you essentially are solving the problem. Um, then, sorry, uh, then it is underserved needs. So yes, there are target customers, but uh, if those target customers do not have underserved needs or essentially problems that are there to be solved, then you do not have a market. So market need to have both components, the, the target audience and the problem that they have. Um, we we'll talk about that in a, in a moment there. Sorry, my keyboard is a bit um, glitching. Then on the other uh, side of it, you have a value proposition. So what's your uh, kind of value proposition or how do you position the value that you're going to deliver through the product? Uh, then we go in next step, which is a feature set. So one is obviously a value proposition, which sometimes can be a bit abstract, but once you can narrow, nail down, nail, narrow it down to a certain features, like how certain features in conjunction work to resolve a certain problem, and through this problem, they deliver the value, that's your feature set. And once you have the feature set, you have essentially your UX, so your customer, as a user experience, customer experience, essentially how everything fits together into uh, one single package that uh, delivers the value uh, and then solve, resolve the problem. And that's kind of your product part. So once you have resolved all of those, or you have figured out and have a clear understanding on all of those five components, you have essentially product market fit. So let's maybe unravel each of those. So uh, kind of these steps, you usually go to build a product market fit. And also because obviously it's not a you know, very sequential. You can do it in, in multiple sequences, but generally you, you do not go um, kind of, generally you try to go from bottom up, but sometimes you can jump between steps. When you learn something on one step, you go to another step. So first is you identify your, your target customers. So, who it is, uh, how do they look, how do they behave, where do you can find them, so on and so on. Once you have uh, identified your target customers, you have uh, you need to enumerate your unmet needs and um, what it means and how to do it. Uh, we're going to talk a bit later, but essentially you need to understand if there are any and if there are, uh, how value, how painful are those or how, I would say, valuable for the particular customer are those. Uh, once you have that, you need to define value proposition. So how uh, your solution is better, what they are currently using, or maybe not currently using, but uh, what they are kind of alternative methods, how they resolve the problem currently. Then you need to identify key features. So what would be the key features of the product uh, that would help resolve uh, the problem? And then obviously, once all of that done, you need to build a MVP and develop and test user experience. So let's talk about market first. Um, I think one important thing about we talk about markets is uh, a focus. I, uh, and although this is not a perfect quote, this is one of the quote that I usually do for a lot of testing. It's from Steve Jobs. Not going to go through things, but essentially it means saying no to 2,000 things instead of trying to pursue 1,000 things at a time. Because uh, having a lack of focus in the market is a, is a very, uh, so having a focus uh, is a crucial thing. A lack of focus is usually what kills companies because you cannot build for everything as well as you cannot build for everyone. So you need to be aware for whom you're building and, and for what problem you're building. So that's why saying no a thousand times is actually more important than saying yes a thousand times. Uh, so what, what I mean by this is that you need to define your one persona, usually your ideal persona that uh, you will be pursuing early on, uh, because most likely if you have two or three, you are not, uh, you do not have enough focus. And at the early stage, when you have lack of resources pretty much on all fronts, uh, it is really hard to build for everyone. So what it means is 
you need to have the one uh, persona which is focused it's, it's sequential and it is part of essentially your uh, your strategy to to uh, pursue pursue the market right so you need to as i said you need to focus your few resources on a few needs and this overall having it like pretty much printed out and put on the wall or having it somewhere there visible it usually helps you and your team to focus the efforts otherwise it's it's still like those crazy ideas in the shower they come up every day and it's you need to battle those um so with rare exception, to be honest, every great company uh, began with a product came to solve a one uh, for one user type. It's it, if you take like any Uber, Airbnb, Google, well, most of the greats right now, Netflix, usually they had only one persona in the beginning, and then once they had become bigger, when they had uh, they had more resources, when they were able to expand, they usually expanded to additional adjacent personas. So how do you define it? So um, you need to not only define it as a demographic as in, well, that's like woman age 25, 35, living, I don't know, in Berlin and, I don't know, working as a manager in, I don't know, some, of, uh, some office, right? That's not enough. Uh, what you actually need to do, and this is uh, where it becomes really hard, you need to build all the additional things or you need to research additional things that would help you drive your decisions. So one is, uh, which is probably the most difficult to do right now is a psychographic uh, traits. If you can narrow down your psychographic profile, it helps a lot. You can use either ocean or disc, which is ocean is, uh, is a five traits, uh, like openness, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeable neuroticism. Disc is actually I forgot what disc was, but you can look it up. Uh, both of them work. Uh, I prefer Ocean myself, but you can use either. If you can build it around those uh, criteria, it helps a lot because building products, for instance, for agreeable people and building it for disagreeable people as a kind of customers actually changes a lot both on your like what your value proposition will be what your feature set will be what your ux should be like so it's it's you obviously will not be able to make it like 100 percent right but at least having some understanding helps a lot uh you need to outline whether they hang out online or offline oh, sorry and what are uh, other products they are using either for um their kind of already solving the problem you will be trying to solve for or at least what are the regular adjacent products that are very commonly using and usually once you start looking at the patterns you will see that people are using similar products across bigger uh, data sets and uh, the, why understanding where they hang out and what kind of other products you're using well first you can copy and or steal great artist steel second uh, you can uh, understand uh, how you can build uh, synergies between additional products are there ways to integrate other ways to borrow some functionality other ways to synergize in terms of prompt so a lot of those things will come up if you do the research and then how you understand what are the products what are the space essentially both online and offline uh, where those uh, customers or tar target audience hangs out and uh, well, the last one, but uh, not the least one, is what is their behavior, current behavior that show that uh, they actually have the problem that you are trying to solve for. Because if the behavior doesn't show they have the problem, then probably the problem is not really worth solving, or you will be having a hard time convincing them that this is a problem and uh, well, essentially converting, solving the problem for some kind of monetary benefits um yeah so next is identify user problems and needs um so how do you do it obviously there's quantitative analysis you can do a lot there are currently like online there are a lot of data sets you can borrow also both for free and not for free but a lot of data sets are for free you can essentially if you are researching like markets or researching the problems that probably already some research have been done in academia and, and elsewhere that can prove that this problem exists and if you will be raising money this some kind of research will be needed anyway so it's worth doing it early uh quality surveys and user studies um friends and families or acquaintances of friends and families well 
uh, as a startup builder, you need to be resourceful. So figuring out how you can gather those target audience, uh, like sample group and sending some kind of surveys or doing interviews, well, sorry, surveys or user studies is also helpful. Market research, similar to the first one, but this one is more about uh, looking at competition, looking in the industry and so on. Um, formal discussions with, uh, I don't know, with your acquaintances, with colleagues, with whatever people, essentially all of this helps. Uh, and heuristics as in previous experience or intuition based on previous experiences, you worked in an industry or you worked in adjacent industry, you've seen it and you just feel it, it also helps. Um, now, talking about the underserved needs or problems. So there are generally two types of needs uh, that we need to distinguish between. So one is unmet needs, as in customer needs that uh, customer need that are adequately met by current solutions. That sorry. So one is essentially, in simple terms, is people that are, that people realize they have a problem, and other is people do not have uh, they do not realize they have a problem. The first one, which is uh, when they realize they have a problem, is an un unmet need. So customer essentially, uh, they there is some kind of solution that solves this problem, solves that need, but the solution is not adequate. It's either inefficient or it's not very good from customer experience perspective. So it's kind of lacking. So you can you think you can build a better one. Or unrealized need, uh, it means that customers essentially do not realize they have a problem. So for instance, an example here when Uber or Airbnb appeared, I mean, uh, nobody knew that they need an Uber because there, there was a taxi already, right? Taxi could get you on demand from point A from to, to point B, but like the whole customer experience and, and so on, it was, well, we know how it was. No offense to taxi drivers, but I mean, who is taking taxi nowadays? Uh, so uh, that's kind of type of an un, un, uh, unrealized need. Uh, for those, you unfortunately cannot do the classical research. It's a lot about understanding the problem and then building a solution um, that is so innovative that um, it pretty much changes the industry, but it's much, much harder to do for this. It's much easier to go up for unmet needs than unrealized needs. So going <clears throat> a bit deeper into this, uh, so if, we, if you're trying to figure out what are the uh, unmet needs are, um, so for this, you need to, to pretty much ask people what they, they, what they want uh they it means that if they say that they want something or they have a problem and this is not solved then this is what you are kind of building for uh for this you can do the iterative improvements quite much better because it's 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 for unmet needs it's uh, much easier to do the iterative improvement uh it's also much less risky um because you are not kind of building essentially market from scratch you're already solving for existing problem or for existing market. Uh, it's much easier to get uh, the insight from the user data analysis. Um, and opportunities is easy to spot. Uh, the kind of downside is usually it's much slower to grow uh, for those type of markets than for the second one, uh, which we will be addressing. So uh, the second one is it solves for latent problem, as in problem that users do not understand they have. Uh, it means that you are betting on greenfield. So essentially, uh, it's a term from agriculture when you are kind of putting a seed in a greenfield as in nothing is planted there. So essentially, if this will grow, then you can pretty much take the whole field. So no, but there is no competition there right now. It is high risk, high reward, uh, obviously. It also disregards status quo. So it means that there is uh, kind of maybe some companies that are working the same uh, area, same uh, market, but they're doing such a poor job that if you are kind of understand this and unrealized need and to resolve it, then you pretty much uh, can delete the status quo and build on top of it. Um, yeah, uh, it requires much more innovative or fresh thinking. And it's, uh, as I already mentioned a couple of times, it usually creates new markets. Um, yeah. So uh, now we talked about the user uh, user and the market uh, or the user and the problem. Let's talk about the market attractiveness a bit more, a bit as well, which is kind of two things in, in conjunction. Um, so generally, there are three things that you want to look 
for uh, in market attractiveness. And this is, again, I'm telling you as an investor. <laughs> so first of all, obviously, is market size. So uh, how big is the market overall uh, for which we're solving this problem? The second one, what is the market growth potential? The market uh, might be uh, small right now, but like all the data or trends show that this market would grow, I don't know, two, three X uh, year over year. That's why you want to do you as a, as a founder or the early employee want to build as fast as possible. And that's why also investors want to jump into it because they see a big potential, let's say in five, 10 years. And then uh, what's the competitive dens density? Disregarding the first two, if the, 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 the um, competitive density is really, really high, then it probably will be really hard to penetrate. Although there are certain exceptions to it, for instance, if you are pursuing a com very competitive market, which is very fragmented and that it's like there is no um, major player or dominant player there that you can build, uh, you can essentially do the platformization of the market and then build a layer on top, but that goes into, into this unmet and realized need. So essentially, you would become a kind of a, a player on top, which takes on this competitive density and you build a central layer on top. So that's different, but generally you want to kind of avoid market with a high competitive density. Um, yeah, so attractive markets, big market with a lot of opportunity, growing market with potential to add a lot of value over time, marketing markets with few competitors addressing user problems. That's kind of your ideal uh, scenario where you want to pursue uh, a new company. Now we talked about the market, the lower part of the pyramid. Um, as you remember, there is a, the upper part of the pyramid, which is the product itself. Uh, the product is a bit more difficult than the market, or the market is not easy. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, and uh, the product has three things, but we will be going on over them like in a bit different format. So. Um, Again, I just described what the product. So uh, first is uh, defining the value proposition. Uh, as you remember, this is like the lower part. So what does it mean? So first is what uh, the product service you are building. Um, what is actually the service, right? How, we, how can you describe it in like a couple of sentences or how, how do you know it's, it's, it's actually a product itself? Because if it's just an idea, it's not really a product. Then who? Uh, well, we already described like who is our target market, but once you start solving it, once you kind of building it, the actual product usually have a particular person in mind who you, who you know how, who you will know that by using your product, they will resolve the problem and they resolve it in a certain way that uh, you intend the product to resolve it. And then how uh, it's usually um, the business model employed to deliver the product. So the market is strategy to uh, drive growth and usually also the monetization. Uh, because if you cannot uh, monetize it or you cannot earn any money, then well, pretty much there is no business. Um, now, um, you, how you do it, you pretty much ask yourself three questions. Uh, one is how will product address customer better than any alternative? And sometimes the alternative is not, not always a competitor. It's sometimes the, um, how to call it, alternative competitor or alternative solution. So uh, for instance, uh, an example would be uh, if you would be looking for, uh, for a, Let's say you're looking for a job, right? In the old days, you could have been, well, before LinkedIn, for instance, before any job site, you could have been looking through the newspaper. There is a solution, but it's not digital or, not, or again, uh, using a taxi or there can be people somehow, or let's say entertainment, uh, or let's say, I don't know why Pinterest came into, into mind. Uh, let's say if you want to uh, do a design project and need to come up with like, small uh, design deck or kind of mood board, uh, you would go now to Pinterest, but before that you just go through like a bunch of magazines and try to collect the photos and so on. So anyway, they usually uh, for any solution, even if there are not direct competitors, there are indirect competitors or alternative competitors. Uh, the second one is um, all the needs that you uh, could address, but also which ones are matters matters most? Because usually, in one uh, solution, in one kind of 
set of needs. There are a lot of adjacent needs that uh, can be addressed at the same time, but usually it's really hard to address all of them end to end. And this is where you kind of expanding your feature set, expanding uh, what your product does comes to, to mind. But in the beginning, you need to address a very narrow uh, set of uh, problems. And um, yeah, this is uh, what is the biggest impact? Uh, which of those will have the biggest impact and take the least amount to an effort to produce? So essentially, most uh, output out of the least input. Um, another thing uh, to, talk, uh, to kind of take into account is the value and service convenience. Um, so there are three tenets uh, in uh, market differentiation. Sorry, give me a break. Mm -hmm. um, so first one is um, value. So delivering more value than any competitive solution, as in you pay the same price, but you get like five times more value, right? So that's one way how to differentiate. Another is uh, service as a first principle. So establishing user trust. So for instance, I don't know if you noticed, we have essentially two similar services like Bolt and Vault, but Vault uh, generally positions themselves as much more customer uh, centric, customer friendly, which I know a lot of people kind of, that's why they specifically use Vault because if anything happens, they can always reach out to support. Support is very responsive. They always give you like, I don't know, coupons for late deliveries, blah, blah, blah. And then convenience, um, again, a huge, huge uh, pillar, but uh, usually it means that um, you either can uh, make everything convenient through data, through uh, personalization, through uh, self-service things and so on. But um, again, those are usually how you uh, differentiate the market position. Like each of those can be <laughs> talked about pretty much for days, but uh, usually if you try to figure out one of the ways how you position yourself, this is one of those, uh, you need to be thinking of one of those or maybe even two pillars at the same time. So once you have uh, kind of figure out the value proposition, you have uh, figure out how your pr product more or less will be look like, you need to start uh, thinking, okay, how can we figure out what would work and what wouldn't work? Because obviously when you have the market, you have some overall value proposition, the execution matters a lot and you can build in a lot of different things, uh, sometimes more automated and less automated. Sometimes UX can be completely different. So that's why you always need to be thinking about uh, how to validate um, things as you go on. So essentially think of it, you the, the, kind of the whole point of product management is to reduce a risk as you go further and further into product development. And in the pyramid the same way like a market and those things can be validated in a very cheap way uh, market and the use, user range because it mostly just work the further you go up the pyramid up to ux it requires more and more expensive resources specifically developers which are not only expensive from like salary standpoint but also ex expensive from alternative um, well, opportunity cost standpoint, because if you're building thing A, you are not building for uh, thing B. And you want to have the highest confidence that you're building for thing B that will deliver the highest impact. So that's why you want to ideate your solution hypothesis. So uh, how you do it is um, uh, you want to deliver the value as quickly as possible. Uh, so essentially, build for something, like create for something, not even build at this point, but create for something so that it can deliver some kind of perceived value. And you can test if this value is actually um, worth building for. Uh, then um, uh, this is essentially where you move from problem space to solution space, because all of the things we have discussed before, it's mostly about thinking, okay, user problems, how we can um, how we can uh, solve for this problem, how we can solve it in some alternative ways. But at this point, you are stop thinking more. You stop thinking about the problem space. You're moving to what's called solution space or solutioning. And uh, you might have at this point have multiple hypotheses or my, or my, my multiple assumptions that um, might be true or might not be true. And if 
you, you will not validate them. You will never know if they're true or not. So you need to validate those assumptions or your hypothesis. So uh, at this point, some kind of ideation document should be created. It's not a mandatory thing, but uh, I would strongly suggest, especially if you have not build, been building products for a long time, to create at least like a one-pager document that essentially describes all the things that we're talking about before, plus your assumptions about the solution, what you know, you what you don't know. Uh, in product development usually uh, there is a thing called product requirement documents prt which can be like multiple pages or tens of pages long uh, but that's usually for a much larger much larger companies much like further stage companies where risks of building for wrong things are, are much higher um, because uh, you need to be delivering value delivering growth all the time but even at early stages having some kind of document uh, helps a lot I have done it myself for the company that we're building right now. Uh, first of all, because you can, you, once you're putting things on paper, you actually, your thinking becomes clearer. And uh, second is because it's then can be shared with uh, well, your co-founders, early employees and so on. Um, and it's much easier to read through the document than talk about your assumptions in the verbal form. Uh, because then everybody can agree like written text is much easier to agree upon than it's um than it's a, verb, a verbal discussion um yeah and at this point one big thing i would uh, really really strong to strongly suggest is to stop being attached to the solutions as in uh yes you're entering the solutioning uh, phase but um but still you need to be thinking about the problem space and not the solution that you're trying to build or so there's a saying is uh fall in love with the problem not the solution uh so um uh, this is where we jump into uh classical uh scientific method um this is a kind of the method that is used for pretty much validating any assumption it is the same that you use for scientific discovery the same use you think you do in product the same thing you link to do like in product experimentation and so on the idea is very simple you have your hypothesis which you or uh, which is the first part where you have ideated certain solution you can come up with a certain solution um, in written form and maybe like early 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 uh, stage prototype and uh, you have certain assumptions that okay this thing might be true this thing might be true this thing might be true uh, you need to design some kind of test around how to prove that things can be true or not uh, not true um, unfortunately we'll not go into testing today but hopefully later uh, lecturers will go over it so essentially there are a lot of Testable, testable um, approaches that you can do to test if uh, your assumption is valid or not. If you invalidate it, then uh, you need to look through uh, what are the outcomes or what are the reasons that it was invalidated. And if the reasons are so kind of, if your assumption was so far off that it's not po no point to iterate, then you pretty much reject and move, move to a new assumption. If if there are some assumptions that are partially true, partially untrue, then you iterate. You you kind of make a different version. You uh, adjust your assumption and run the test again to kind of disvalidate or uh, validate. If if your uh, assumptions were uh, were validated and um, uh, and then you kind of uh, approve them, then you can move to the next step. Which is, this is here like has two things merged into one. But uh, it's kind of at every stage you need to be going through this process. So this one is even before you actually build anything, but the same thing applies uh, once you build something. So for instance, if you um, give you an example for something uh, that we are testing for is uh, we're testing for um, personalized uh, food delivery. So we were testing, okay, how often people actually want things to be delivered to them. And before we even actually build all the delivery uh, planning solution and so on, we're testing, okay, uh, are the people more keen to be delivered once a day, twice a day? We have an early group of people who we can ask for. And, and we've proven that we had actually disagreement. Do we deliver every second day, every three times a day or uh, every day? And we found that actually some people do not do not like to get to food delivered like 
every single every three hours or four hours because by now people actually fed up waiting for courier and so on but also uh the food becomes less fresh if it's delivered every second day so kind of every every day uh is a way and we found out that it's similar how other companies felt so this is something that goes into solution uh brief this is something that we will be building for but you can take any assumption that you might have uh, about timing about pricing about um solution and then just ask users and validate and go in the, in the brief. Later on, obviously, once you uh, not, cannot ask certain things, you need to actually show it and, and how you how user will interact with it. And the same reason applies is just instead of asking, you're building or you're uh, using uh, different types of experimentation. Right, so um, I already talked about draw attached to user problem and solutions, uh, allow to assess potential solutions with scientific objectivity, as in try to isolate uh, things that uh, can be isolated. And then if you're testing for pricing, then try to isolate pricing as much as possible. If you're testing for frequency, try to isolate frequency. So there is no cross pollution or uh, essentially the tests are as clean as possible so that you can then validate that your assumptions were correct. Doesn't matter if you're doing, uh, if you're doing easy user interviews, uh, then you need to design your questions in the same, in some in, in way that are clean, that uh, can kind of drive to the right answer. Or if you're doing survey, then you also need to kind of survey in an isolated way. If you're running it on a live test, like in experimentation, the same thing applies still. You want to isolate the thing from, so that none, none of the other thing can influence your um, the test. Um, yeah, and why this is actually helpful and why we kind of doing the experimentation or iterative scientific method approach because it's actually stimulates innovative thinking. Because uh, even if your first assumption and in most cases your first assumption will be uh, disvalidated and you might be feeling down that oh well I had those assumptions and they are not working for me now. Um, it means that the problem is still there. You might find a new, a new solution or new hypothesis to test that actually might work. In most cases, the first iteration will always fail. You need to run multiple iteration to actually get the results. So always remember, for instance, the same like COVID vaccine was done pretty much the same way. You have the assumption, you have like pathogen plus uh, solution and you mix them, you run some mixing tests, blah, 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 then you get the results, okay, it doesn't work. Then and you need to run thousands of tests before you get to the solution. So it pretty much comes from scientific method that is used for scientific research. The product market fit is the same thing. Um, yeah, so um, I already described this. This is a very complex schema. I'm not gonna go into much time because we are a bit of uh, or late on time, but you can, uh, and they read through it afterwards, essentially just describes the same scientific method that I can uh, already describe just in a different form. Um, right, uh, so now that we have overall solution that uh, is clear and uh, we agree that this is something that needs to be built, you need to, we need to define what are the features of this solution? This is again where the feature brief or the solution brief is actually helpful because um, in either ways, if you're yourself a developer or if you're giving the, um, giving the job to developer, it still helps to have a very rough outline what are the features you're building. Even if you're building everything yourself, um, I'm like building the app right now myself uh, with, with one designer and uh, we are still having uh, like 2D roadmap of every feature that we want to build now. We want to postpone to the version 2.3, whatever, because uh, building things that usually it's a much, much more uh, granular process and you always forget the bigger picture. So it's always helps to have uh, a feature set. So um, kind of why do you need, uh, it was, I was mentioned why you would need to document your feature set, but so now that you have outlined the value that you want to deliver, you have outlined or more or less what are the kind of core components of your um, value proposition, a minimal viable solution. Um, now you need to define the feature set. Um, this actually also means uh, what, what I already saying. It means that you will need to say no for now, at least for now, to say no to a lot of things because you will not have resources to build for everything, and you need to keep those things 
that you want to build in mind, but you usually need to postpone them for later once you have more resources and once you have traction or whatever. So you need to actually narrow it down to your core set of features that is going to be part of your MVP. Um, yeah, you also need to understand your development capacity, your engineering hours, and also your uh, desired launch date, because that actually will be probably the biggest dictator how much stuff you can build by then. Um, so I'm going to give like a very obviously mature products, which hopefully most of you know, uh, to kind of give an example how you work with features and uh, that maybe will help you. That's not the only way how to do it, but this is uh, how to visually easily visualize it. So let's take Google Maps, for example. Um, it has a lot of different features. It's kind of like street view, 3D map, GPS tracking, traffic, uh, local search, location search, sharing, timeline and so on. There's a lot of features, like it's much, it's a very mature product. But essentially, if you put them together and those not all, all features, it's uh, it's create what's called a product bundle or sorry, feature bundle. Uh, essentially, if you put all the features together, that's your feature bundle. Sometimes uh, one product can have multiple feature bundles. So for instance, there is a like profile feature bundle, there is like uh, maps feature bundle and so on. But for simplicity right now, we're gonna talk about that there is a feature bundle. Um, so you can either add new features, obviously, uh, that's easy. Uh, you can rethink the feature or enhance the feature because sometimes uh, you can see that, okay, we have certain thing, but we already built certain thing or we have envisioned certain thing, but in that format, it will not work. Or sometimes you don't even need to build a new thing. Sometimes you need to rebuild uh, certain things. So that's where enhancing features and obviously there is uh, removing features. And I personally think that it, it's always need to be thinking like, do we actually need things? And some and removing features is, it should be way more common than everybody uh, thinks, even at the early stages, why I'm kind of adding this here, because sometimes uh, people do not realize how much effort it takes to actually maintain features and, and to make them work. And sometimes they're not worth it even, and they're not delivering so much value. That's why your prior research about hypothesis and everything is so important for kind of thinking about features. So um, kind of talking about what features to prioritize. Uh, first of all, you want to find, and this is very important, you want to find opportunities to solve uh, multiple problems with single features. So if you can build one feature, but it solves uh, multiple use cases and multiple problems at the same time, great. That's kind of the perfect type of feature you always want to be building. But because it means that it's, it's a potential for a bigger expansion later on, but also attracting additional users early on. Second one is um, uh, you try push broadly applicable features or features designed for a specific use case or segment. Uh, it's very similar to the first one, um, but the difference is that uh, you, um, so let's say, um, which one I would say, um, boom, boom, boom. Nothing comes to mind right now. I will come up something to mind. I will later let you know. Um, right. So also look for creating recurring value over one uh, one time value. Uh, in this case, it's if your product overall, depending on its frequency, depending on how often users will be interacting with the product, like how it is intended, or how often usually it's happened. It depends on how often the problem itself occurs because the problem occurs frequently than most, or let's say daily, then most likely you want people to interact with your product daily. That means that you want to build uh, features that will kind of drive daily interaction overall. And you need to prioritize those over one time thing. I don't know, like document upload, some settings, some things in onboarding. Yes, onboarding is super important, but building a very complex feature that uh, does not improve onboarding like tenfold or even hundredfold over not having a core feature that kind of people will solve the problem on a daily or even weekly basis uh, makes zero sense. So you always want to prioritize features that will solve problem more frequently or will be interacted eventually more frequently because uh, kind of why it's important because if people interact with the like general rule of thumb is the more people or more often people interact with the problem <clears> or <throat> the product 
it means that they receive value from the product. It means that it's going to be staying on their top of mind. It means that they're going to be retaining for longer. There are some exceptions to the rule for like uh, efficiency enhancing product, but more or less that's kind of the use the rule of thumb. Um, yeah, that's uh, one thing that is actually also not. Uh, this one is not uh, very um, common sense. It, uh, it kind of makes sense, but it's not usually uh, what I see in a lot of organizations. People focus a lot on capturing value instead of creating value. Again, general rule of thumb, if you create value and the value is actually, you're actually solving the problem, you will figure out to, how to monetize those users. People will be willing to pay for good products or good solutions. Uh, if you're only focusing on capturing value and they can be generating revenue over actually delivering value itself, yes, it might give you like a certain boost in the in the beginning or in the short term, but in the long run, usually those product will fail of the pro or the product that are focusing on value delivery in itself over the value capture. Uh, yeah, what is this one? Uh, yeah, so that's kind of we move to the next stage is uh, now that you uh, that the value you intend to deliver has been defined, uh, the why and solution has been identified, the what you need to spec how you deliver the value as quickly as possible. Uh, so this is kind of the, the final stage. And actually, sorry, this one is, is duplicate slide. I need to remove it later. Um, yeah, I mean, one more thing, although, although we talked about feature prioritization a lot, um, I kind of want to put one uh, simple framework that there are a lot of them, kind of feature prioritization is an art in itself, uh, but the one that I can uh, usually ask people to do is RICE, so RICE it's a very simple framework which essentially uh, uses uh, reach, impact, confidence, and effort as a inputs to which features we're building or not. Uh, obviously, all the things that I can uh, mention that um, like how often it's going to be used, is it solving multiple use cases and so on and so on, those things are usually going to reach impact and confidence. So uh, this is uh, how much it will kind of impact one of those three. And then you divide it by effort, some can be in hours or whatever. And um, there are a lot of different frameworks. I'm not going to go into into this. There is also ICE, there is Moscow, and, and some other. It just um, um, usually if you have a lot of features, doing at least not just I'm going to build this or this or this, but having some kind of list that is prioritized helps. Even if you're not going to follow it completely, it helps you to kind of clear. It kind of helps to remove the noise. Because things that, that are in the list, but uh, by all metrics will be just go down, uh, will uh, be very low score. You can you can stop focusing on them for now. You can put them in a backlog. Maybe they're gonna be kind of surfacing in a year or whatnot. What it helps usually why those scoring methodologies are important is to what are the like. If let's say you have 20 or 30, what are the top five? What are the top three? Because those are things that you need to be kind of grooming, you need to be understanding, you need to be um, kind of more focused on and figuring out are they worth building. And that kind of helps you not focus on 30 items or 20 items at the same time, but focus on, on the very few things at the same time. Um, yeah, so this is essentially if you have your five, everything that uh, um, falls below this cutoff line, uh, this is uh, then it it uh, usually falls uh, follows after MVP or follows later. Uh, right. So we talked about solution brief. Actually, this is um, uh, I already talked about it. I'm not going to repeat myself, but uh, this is why it's important. So I, I really strongly suggest again to write down all your assumptions, all your things on paper, well, digital paper. Um, yeah, and we're moving to put towards prototype. So um, again, no matter how much research you've done, no matter how much you have talked to users, you still need to build something and test it in real life scenario. Um, so uh, you don't know what you don't know. So the only way to know is actually show it to the user and see how users gonna react. There are some exceptions to the rules and uh, you can still do a lot of things. 
but you generally want to test it. Um, um, so for this, to kind of mitigate the risk of spending resources where they need not to be spent, um, try to make as functional prototypes as possible, but maybe do not make uh, production ready prototypes. So you can get the insights as fast as possible, meaning that build them without any um, any additional kind of commitment to resources and so on. So what I suggest nowadays, you can build like mobile application pretty much with very zero, with very uh, little code or almost like zero code or low code uh, is what we are doing. So you can pretty much build like a, uh, a new Uber or whatever with almost zero code, just a couple of couple APIs together. You can still show it to users. You can publish it to the app store. Like there are companies like Flutterflow, Bubble.io, uh, I don't know, Adela, there are a list of them. AppGyver, uh, and then uh, there are things like Backendless and sort of I don't know, like like twenty companies by now who which have helped you to build functional prototypes that are looks and feels almost like a working uh, app. So it doesn't matter web app or mobile app. If you can learn the interface like in a matter of a week, and you pretty much can build it and test it with the users yourself. Um, uh, you can do a, a variable, variable degree of fidelity. I'm already, obviously, if you're using low code or no code uh, solution, it's a, already a quite high degree of fidelity. Uh, there is a story um, for from like early 90s where you probably remember like the first palm computer that's like where proto iPhones, uh, the, the first I think was, um, what was the name of the company? I think it was Palm or iPad. Doesn't matter, but the first kind of, small handheld computers so the prototype that they actually built was just a piece of wood that were the interface and the buttons were drawn on it and and there was a stick uh, like a small stick and their ceo actually was doing pretending to take notes on on uh, on the meetings to see if it would work or not so that's kind of the lowest fidelity you can get but then you can go to a higher fidelity pretty much like uh, with the developed interface, with uh, with working functions, and then you can you can have all the degrees of fidelity for prototypes. But what matters is that this the disregarding what fidelity you go for, you still have a solution. You still have a hypothesis, and through this kind of variable degree of fidelity, you validate this. Uh, uh, you validate your hypothesis. Sorry. Um, yeah, so contact the focus group, consumer surveys, and other means of gathering user feedback so you can uh, iterate all the time and, and um, uh, move forward. Um, yeah, focus on uh, user experience and functional capabilities experienced by the user. So uh, what it means in this to kind of iterate, you need to stop thinking about how the backend would work unless the backend is kind of the core or product. What I mean by that, yeah, for user, it does not matter what's happening on the backend uh, uh, unless user receives value. So if, if you can go with like just having five or whatever, how many people working, doing things manually, as long as for user, it looks like the product is working as intended, that's fine. So kind of you don't need for all the processes perfectly working on the backend. What only matters is how users receive value. There are again always exceptions, but even uh, Google and uh, you know a couple of guys from Google who are my friends, uh, like even they hire like tons of people to do things manually in the backend, and if they see that it works, then usually automate it eventually. Yeah, but you don't need to be focusing on the backend on on essentially the, the backend processes. Um, unless you're actually building a solution for backend process, that's obviously different. Uh, let's see if you're building some kind of warehousing system or dispatch system, then it needs to be done. But in most cases, the user experience is all that matters, also for B2B users to build. Right, and uh, we're moving to product launch. Okay, um, so assuming that you received all the valuable feedback, uh, you did that your prototype testing, and you have test, uh, you have certain level of confidence. Um, then it's actually time to launch the product. So um, usually you do not do like a full blown hundred percent public launch. You usually do like a small beta test and alpha test. Doesn't matter. 
uh, where you kind of release the product to a certain number of qualified users that you recruited previously. You can do it for free. You can do it also to pay, uh, depending what you want to test for. But essentially, you test with a certain group of people. It, the test can be run uh, for variable uh, variable uh, lengths of time from a couple of days to a couple of weeks to a month. Um, and it's still the idea here is to gather as much feedback as possible before you go public with a with a big product. Yes, it's, it takes time, but it's uh, usually uh, the time worth spent because once you launch it, you actually have all the possible uh, feedback you could gather before you launch. Because once you go public, and you launch it to a bigger user base, then it's really hard to change things, first of all. And the second, uh, all the things that were overlooked will eventually start biting, well, once in the ass, uh, both in acquisition, retention, elsewhere. And I'm not. I'm also talking about bugs and so on. Um, yeah, but uh, still, you need to be iterating product pretty much at every stage uh, before you actually, well, pretty much even after launch, you still need to be iterating, just iterations will be done differently. As I, as I, as I mentioned, the whole point, kind of to sum, sum it up, is um, at each stage, well, if you reverse the pyramid from this to this, into the, like a funnel at each stage, you want to have the highest possible confidence that once moving to next stage, uh, you have the right assumptions and the right um, kind of knowledge to move forward and achieve the maximum possible degree of success. Um, yeah, and then you need to do the impact analysis. Obviously, we already talked about it. Um, right, that's uh, about the product market fit or general overview of the product market fit. Unfortunately, um, um, this is not nowadays is not enough to actually build a successful company because apart from having a product market fit, there are two additional kind of pillars to this, which is um, which is channel and uh, and uh, model. Uh, so we're going to be talking about those next. So nowadays, if we want to build a successful running company, the, the product market fit needs to be expanded with the channel and model. So you have actually product channel uh, market model fit, which is like a four square, which interacts between themselves. And uh, although we have talked about the product market fit, we can, after the small break, we'll talk about the ch uh, channel model fit as well. Now we have a small question break, and I see some, there are some comments in the um, in the chat. So maybe we can stop here. If there are some questions, I would be gladly answering those. Then we can move forward. I see there's already a raised hand. Jan okay. has raised a hand. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for for the story and the presentation. Uh, one question, could you elaborate a little bit on, um, you talked about capture versus create value uh, by some examples or, or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, I have one really good example, but I'm under NDA with that company. I cannot uh, disclose it. I will try to figure out something that is very similar. Um, Okay, um, so you, you know, there are companies that sell you content, like, um, I don't know, there are companies like, uh, I mean, not content as in um, like uh, digital content, as the videos and so on, but companies like sell you some courses or stuff like that, like there's courses or some kind of uh, generated content where you, based on your inputs you get some kind of report stuff like that so it can be things like some course to either earn money like those are like tons of how to become a millionaire in 10 days or something uh so uh, those type of companies actually great example of how you do not do it so if you can, if you see that they're pretty much their core value is creating content, uh, the core value that they're selling is content like courses or some tips and tricks, maybe um, like an hour with a mentor, 
but um, underneath, essentially, they are uh, giving you some free content at the beginning, and then it's pretty much closing you to upsell you through all other means instead of actually building the product that would solve the problem, which is, I don't know, let's say they are selling um, some real estate courses, like how to become a real, how to be, become an investor in real estate or some, I don't know, how to become an investor in stock, which is like probably not possible to learn like in a couple of weeks anyway but uh i mean the problem is still there you want to sell real estate better or you want to uh you want to trade stock better right so they're pretty much optimizing for kind of trying to squeeze you out of money and then once you squeeze you out of money they don't care uh well they're gonna try to squeeze you out of more money but that's kind of the whole business model but the actual value is not there because it's content usually is shit so instead of building product that actually tries to kind of to build a better trader uh, uh, trader board or something, which is actually a valid uh, solution, or having some um, a real estate market analytics tools that allows you to see, okay, where are the fluct prices are fluctuating, where you need to buy or sell. Um, there are companies like that, for instance, they're doing like Airbnb market analytics. So depending on that, you can buy or sell real estate for, let's say, Airbnb investment. So instead of doing this, which actually delivers value on top of what you're doing, they're kind of trying to squeeze you out of value uh, through just selling more content. So you're optimizing the whole product is, is optimized for the funnel, how to squeeze money out of you. Um, that's kind of something that comes into mind, but there are probably some other things. So essentially, it's 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 overly relying on monetization instead of building actual uh, kind of solution that resolve the same problem. Hopefully, answer the question. Um, anyone else? I see in the chat there's the question about the example of ideation document. Maybe you have something like that. Mm, an example. I do have examples, but those are also under NDA. <clears throat> um, but um, uh, Paul, can you remind me afterwards? I will try to find something that is more neutral. Uh, yes, by all means. I will uh, resolve it uh, in some way. Um, yeah, but. Uh, I mean, they are um, a variable degree of complexity and details and so on. Uh, I would say there is no one prescriptive form how to do it. Um, it's it's just how generally the this ideation ha document has um, three four parts, pretty much the same way as uh, the pyramid has. It usually has. The problem description, so the problem is clearly stated. Uh, well, first of all, the audience. Obviously, there is a user persona that you described. Uh, for that, I can easily give you the type of user persona. So user persona described with all the things that I have uh, mentioned before. Then you have a problem statement. So what problem we're trying to solve? Uh, because once you put it on table, you may say, well, that problem is like shit, bullshit. <laughs> no, it's not worth uh, solving, right? Uh, and then actually proof of the problem, the proof that the problem actually exists, so either some quotes from users or some market research. Um, and then when you have that, you have the solution hypothesis. So you have, okay, uh, this is a solution we are trying to build. Uh, usually you write up some alternative solutions, some market research. So what our competitors are doing, uh, maybe some table of uh, how our solution would compare to those solutions. That's usually your main kind of um, ideation part of the document. And then later it can be expanded in a multitude of ways, but this usually is like one to two pages of text, well, with some tables and graphs. Um, and this is something usually you, you need to put, because you would do it anyway, if you're building a company or conducting that type of research, you would do it anyway, it just helps to have it, because trust me, you will reuse it multiple times afterwards, either you're for your, uh, either for communicating with your co-founders or with your early employees or uh, taking some like notes or some like da data or some, I don't know, links from there for your, I don't know, uh, pitch deck for your investors. Doesn't matter. Trust me, it, it will, you will be returning to it anyway. So it's worth to 
pretty much you're not doing anything on top you're just putting everything on paper that's it anything else or can we move on uh, oh, yes and david has raised his hand yeah i was just wondering um if you it seems like most of your work is focused on software but i was just wondering if you also had um, some experience with uh, developing physical products Good question. Um, yeah, my previous experience, apart from the one that we're working right now, is mostly uh, software. Um, but uh, hardware project products are essentially similar. It's just the iteration cy uh, cycles are much much slower. But still, you will you will need to iterate. I mean, I spoke to a couple of companies who, well, not a couple, but quite a lot of companies who are doing uh, hardware, um, and. I mean, the the main difference, obviously, is that there is a big, big um, kind of part of the journey where you move from uh, like early develop or prototype development to the manufacturing line, uh, because that's where you need to figure out like, okay, are we have we done the, all the research before we uh, actually launch the production line? This is probably the hardest part, and. I'm I'm not I'm lying to you that this is where I'm not as competent, but uh, kind of the couple of tips that I can say that uh, when you're doing the prototype, you're still going to be doing prototype testing, and uh, your low fidelity prototypes are going to be like 3D printed or doing built by hand or whatever. Uh, most of them, obviously, there are probably some electric engineering. Then you have some people in a garage solding or something, but still, you're going to be doing a lot of things um in a scrappy way so uh, the only thing that i would suggest to do there is once you do the kind of choice of components is talk to talking to the manufacturers potential manufacturers or at least having some friends acquaintances maybe angel investors so on who who know how the large-scale manufacturing works so that you know that uh choice of components, choice of technologies, choice of methods of production will be scalable and actually will drive unit economics in the right way. I mean, I, we are doing it right now, but not maybe in, in electrical engineering, but we have a hardware component to, to the product. This is actually how we're solving it. We just have X uh, guy who have was running like seven, nine production facilities. And he's the one who's helping us to iterate the early stage while saying okay this is how we're going to build it like at in two years um this is how it's done so you need to do this and this is this unfortunately there's probably no other way maybe there are but i don't know thank you cool so are we good to go to move on yeah i think we can move on then cool Okay, uh, so moving on. Um, as I mentioned, so you have a product market fit, uh, but um, additional on top of product market fit, you have two more components to essentially to go to market successfully. And uh, those components are, um, I would say essential. Uh, this method is not by any, mean, by any means my invention. This is coming from, uh, from Casey, uh, it's it's late. I forgot the the, the name. Uh, he is currently a chief product officer and bright, but he also was involved in many other companies. Uh, so this is his framework. So essentially, uh, the idea that um, only having a product market fit is not enough. Why? Because once you launch the product, obviously you have initial like kind of um, um, spike in users. Uh, but then after the initial hypes die, uh, dies, then you have usually a drop off by users and everybody, okay, we need to build a new feature to kind of, and that new feature again drives a spike in users and then it's a never ending, uh, ne never ending, a never ending death cycle because eventually you cannot always build new features. You need to establish a sustainable growth. So, as I said, so there is um, um, kind of the, the framework is how do you build a hundred million dollar business? So you have a product market fit, which is obviously a must have. You cannot go without two. But on top of that, you have a model, uh, which is called the model market fit. And the model is your essentially your business model. How do um, 
how do you run your business? Is it like a subscription? Is it uh, is it uh, like pay as you go? Is it I don't know e-commerce? Is it even free? Maybe so. There are a lot of different business model, and on top of that, you need to have a channel. Uh, so you, it's uh, kind of model channel feed and product channel feed. So channel means that through which uh, channels you will distribute your product and not like only acquiring users, but as in our days, it's, it's good to say distribute because it can be a website, it can be a mobile app, it can be a physical product. Uh, any of the type of the product needs to have a channel for distribution. If you're, uh, I will now give more example, the physical product, more, mostly you need to figure out, okay, are we going to sell in stores? Are we going to sell through Amazon? Are we going to uh do like door-to-door -door sales there are um, a lot of channels for how you do you distribute if it's a digital uh, product is, is again is it the web is it the mobile is it uh maybe an app for another big marketplace like shopify has a marketplace uh there are a lot of marketplace nowadays which you can build there so uh you there are also different channels which you can distribute the product. So kind of having all of those things in, 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 in place actually multiplies the probability to build a successful $100 million business. So let's talk about uh, those. So essentially, as I said, it's, it's about how you monetize and how you distribute. Uh, so first, let's talk about monetization. This one is probably the hardest part because um, although monetization is kind of, um, I would say not the hardest, but it's uh, oftenly, very often overlooked because a lot of times monetization is done by analogy, as in, well, somebody does subscription or my friend does subscription, will do subscription, or somebody does transactional, will just going to be tra uh, doing transaction. But actually monetization, just by analogy, in most cases fail. You need to do monetization from the grounds up. And um, so okay, that there is a holistic monetization approach. Uh, the framework is way more complex than that, but I'm going to give you like an overview of it. Um, so first, you need to understand the problems we're solving. Uh, that's usually done in your kind of first step of the process. Then the second one, um, for who uh, we're solving your problem for? Again, usually you have done the first step of the process. And then how we solve the problem. So uh, again, you ha should have done. So those are the, obviously you cannot drive your monetization or your um, you cannot choose monetization from if you don't have those because those are the prerequisites. So essentially, your monetization model needs to be tied to your use case, not the other way around. It, it's really hard to figure out the monetization and then attach a use case to it. Um, so uh, by, by use cases. What I described first, the small pyramid, and then you have monetization model. So, um, kind of how you outline it is pretty much the same way. Um, how the problem is defined by user, what group of users has this problem, why do users cho choose a product to solve the problem, and how frequently the user encounters the problem. The last one is, uh, is a new one because the frequency of problem, um, kind of the frequency of how the problem is actually encountered by user in, in their life. Uh, is one of the main driving um, kind of inputs in which monetization model to choose. Because you cannot really, um, to give an example and jump a bit ahead, uh, you cannot really uh, ask people to subscribe for a month of subscription if they're going to use the product only every three, three months, so for instance, Prevo, which is a low frequency product. On the other hand, if users are uh, experience the problem uh, every day, um, then uh, you cannot really ask them to um, to do like a once, uh, three months transaction for, let's say, a big batch of problem because they don't know what's the variability of the problem will be. Maybe they will incur it three days in a row and then two days uh, they will have a gap. So you cannot really ask people to commit to a big thing. So there are a lot of variable, uh, variables in play here. Anyway, uh, so taking those into account, um, let's uh, see how you can uh, uh, unravel how can we unravel the monetization model. So first thing you need to be thinking about uh, a lot about is how does your price scale? Because uh, as amount of uh, as as um, users use your product more and more, the prices need to be scaling with that. 
So uh, there are a lot of different metrics how the prices usually scale. So there is a feature differentiated. So as you have more, as you buy more features in the product, you have different subscription plans. So for instance, Figma, which is which is what was acquired by uh, Adobe, um, it has a lot of different features between plans. Same for LinkedIn, they have four I think plans. So like. They have a basic plan, then they have a pro plan, then they have a sales plan, an HR plan, and all of those plans have different features that are enabled through this uh, model. Then you have a usage value metric, so uh, where your pricing goes around the function of usage. So uh, how often you use the product, you have uh, different types of things that I show. It's, uh, for instance, for segmented monthly traffic users, for Slack based on active users, but pretty much every e-commerce is also around the usage value metric because you pay for the product uh, as much as you use it. And it can be both uh, recur recur uh, recurring and non-recurring. So, and then outcome-based metric, oh, sorry, uh, the e-commerce is outcome-based metric, sorry. And then, uh, so it's around, um, this is around usage, this is around outcome. So you you gave, get what you paid for. So uh, you pay either for the product that you you received or you pay for the, well, pretty much here in the same, um, uh, same thing, user testing, you pay for the user interviews uh, you have conducted. By the way, if you're gonna need to test it on some users, user testing is a way to, do user recruiting without uh, actually recruiting from the street. They have a huge database. Uh, now, another thing is um, uh, what uh, what features or attributes the customer get from each use cases. So um, here I'm going to be using Figma as well. Uh, so you have, uh, let's say for starter, you have three projects today, three projects for three day, 30 day evasion up to two editors and so on. Then you have unlimited project and then in organization they have like SSO, uh, single sign-on, they have design system analytics for bigger organization, very really, really important thing. You can analyze the efficiency of the design system and so on. So uh, a lot of differentiation between what? And then the amount, how much do we charge? Um, so here we need to implement a new kind of term, uh, which is called average annual revenue per customer per use case. Uh, why per customer uh, and not per user? Because for B2B, you do not have a user. Well, you might have under one customer, hundreds of users or even thousands of users, but it's still one customer. And you're always calculating around one customer. So if you close, I don't know, a bank, uh, then you also close 100, well, let's say thousand users, but it's still one customer. So you want to calculate around that. Uh, so uh, the amount of how you charge, uh, well, there is a huge variable, right? There is uh, like on a, a small, it's pretty much free. And then there is on the on the longer end, uh, it's like hundreds or sometimes even millions uh, of dollars per uh, per one customer. And then everything in between. And then uh, when is essentially, when do we charge for the what? Um, again, uh, there are a lot of different variables. So there is never, which is free, and there is every few years, which is recurring. Uh, so it means for analytics companies, it's usually you, it's like a long integration cycle. Uh, once they integrate even onboarding fees, once you integrate, you usually they have like a, every two, three years uh, renewal contracts. And then there are monthly recurring, there is a year recurring. So everything in between or everything, uh, let's say even per transaction like Amazon or, or Uber or whatever. So kind of all of this kind of relates to this. I think this is what where you need to like look at it as the most important thing. So uh, kind of talk, taking everything that I already told you is uh, how you need to structure your uh, monetization system. So. First of all, are customers willing to pay? Because sometimes customers are not willing to pay. So if they're not willing to pay, then usually you need to figure out, you need to make your product free and figure out other ways to monetize. And most likely in those cases, if customers are not paying, uh, like users that are not willing to pay, somebody else is paying. Either you're selling data or you're uh, having um, some kind of two-sided marketplace model where the other side of the marketplace play paying for, let's say, in recruitment, a lot of this happening uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, if customers are not willing to pay, then it's usually free. 
If they are willing to pay, then um, what is the natural frequency of usage? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so two, two questions you need to ask yourself. So what is the natural frequency of usage? What is the, navar, natu, is the variance in the, the natural frequency of usage? So it means that is it happening daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, maybe yearly, right? The product that you are needing, the problem and the product that you use every day, uh, like food and transportation is like, um, public or daily transportation is pretty much like a daily, weekly thing. There are products that you maybe use, as for instance, travel, you use every so, on, so often, or and there are products that, for instance, like buying real estate, which you might be do like two, three times in your lifetime, um, right? So, and uh, depending on what's the frequency and then what's the variance, uh, so variance could be, I don't know, um, Actual travel is also can be quite variable, but it's more predictable than some others. So uh, then you either do, uh, if the frequency is low and the variance is high, then usually the result to transaction model. So you pay for essentially for each transaction. If uh, the frequency is high and uh, the variance in frequency is, uh, is low, then you do recurring. So once if you settle on recurring, then you need to look at uh, two more things. First is what is the natural frequency of adoption? And then how long does it take to form a habit? So let's look at the how long does it take uh, to form a habit? It means that every type of product or every type of problem, product uh, that is solving certain problem, people need to create like pretty much restructure their brain to create a habit around usage of this problem or product to solve the problem. If, uh, if it takes uh, a long time to build it, then you have like, there is a probability that they will churn and then you will not be able to get the revenue. Um, on the other hand, uh, natural frequency adoption is how often they can uh, have a cycle uh, where um, where they want to uh, uh, want to kind of um, how to say want to try a new solution again because you might have a high frequency of problem occurrence and you might have a low frequency of vari low, lower variance but they are not changing solution so often right for instance let's think about uh, analytics in the company. Yes, you probably, if you're doing like analytics, working in marketing, in product, in tech, doesn't matter. Uh, you are most likely using the analytics almost daily or at least weekly, but you're not changing analytics every month or so. You're usually changing it only like once a year. So, um, so if uh, natural frequency of adoption is high and it does not take a long time to change the habit, then you usually have a short term uh, subscription. So like monthly or quarterly, or maybe even like weekly, all right? But if your uh, natural frequency adoption is low, meaning that you only change the solution, potentially change the solution like every quarter or year or so, and it also takes a long time to build a habit as in um, to learn your product, to start using it across company or even personal, then you want to have a long-term uh, subscription, like a yearly or so, so you ask a lot of money up front. Uh, okay, uh, now we talked about um, monetization model. One thing what I want to say here is price is not equals value. Uh, sometimes you want to, so, um, so it means that you need to deliver more value than you ask the price for it. Uh, and um, in most cases where you kind of, you win the market is where actually the value is, uh, there is more value than there is a price. Again, features is not value uh, because features are only a way to solve uh, the problem, but you can have a lot of features that are not delivering value whatsoever. So again, this is something to remember. Uh, what you need to be striving for is the price um, is not higher than willingness to pay. So kind of you need to be figure, figure why that the price is always lower than the willingness to pay. Um, yeah, this is already talked. Um, kind of there are a lot of methods and basically we uh, can always scratching the service. Uh, if you're 
looking into this particular, which is probably the most important slide here. Um, the way how to do this is either is a combination of methods called um, MaxDiff and I will share the methods afterwards, but there is a there is a method how you can calculate what is the willingness to pay, and you always need to be in that kind of range of willingness to pay. You not set your price too low because then you'll be losing on revenue, but not too high because then uh, you will be um, well. You will either lose customer, you will not be able to acquire customers. Um, yeah, and you need to be understanding about monthly recurring versus per transaction because if you will be charging customer on unpreferred schedule, as we already discussed uh, before, then um, well, you will add additional friction for the customers who will not be uh, willing to transact with you. Yeah, so how all of this comes together uh, about the scale is how does uh, our price from the company uh, point of view, how does our price scale? And then for a uh, user is how does value of the product scale for me? What what features or attributes do customer receive? And then on the other hand, what features and benefit do I value? Then how much do we charge? How much I'm willing to pay? And when do we charge versus wh when do I want to pay? Uh, so all of those things need to kind of be uh, both aligned because if there is a misalignment, most likely the transaction will not happen and you will not able to monetize and that means that you don't have a product model field and channel model fit. And going back to um, to this and I will leave, leave some more materials afterwards. So we talked about the model, let's talk about the channel. Although I hope um, if I was correct me wrong, I think there is some uh, people who will be uh, touching upon growth and upon like marketing. It's very important to understand how the channel fits into the the rest of the picture because uh, with that you will be able to understand how to kind of design the product in the company uh, very well in the beginning. Um, Generally, there are a lot of distribution channels, but um, you can read uh, about them, all of them in um, kind of a book called Traction. Uh, they outline that there are currently, uh, hopefully there will be more in the future, but currently there are 19 channels to get traction. And uh, those are this. Um, um, so pretty much all of these are kind of Iteration of those are uh, one of the problems, uh, one of the channels that you could use to drive traction. Some of them are better for certain products, others are uh, worse for certain products. Some things that I would um, kind of probably outline here is existing platforms and engineering for growth. Probably those two are the most um, kind of under 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 understated one and also the le the least explored in that book because a lot of uh, companies that are growing fast uh, they are usually growing through some variation of this and probably those two channels that engineering for growth is existing platforms those are two that are um, can be probably separated a bit even further uh Again, I'm not going to go into each channel. That's not the point of this today. What I want to say is that uh, products are built to fit channels, not the other way around. So what I mean by this is that I've seen a lot of companies, they kind of work on the product, they build a great product, they figure out the product market to fit, uh, and it looks like everything good, but then they have the product and they, can, they have not figured out how to distribute it, so how to get it in the, in the hands of the customer. And this is where... Uh, I think nowadays it's impossible to kind of, well, the statement build it and they will come is not true for already like 15, 20 years, but even if build it and figure out the marketing later is no longer true. So you need to be thinking about the distribution before you actually finish the product because each model in each type of market prefers different uh, channels. That's why when we talk about users, where the users hang out, where the users kind of, what kind of product they consume and so on, you can also actually spy on those products and figure out what kind of marketing they are doing and then kind of adjust the product for those particular channels. 
Um, what um, kind of wanted to add additionally here, there's a concept power law of distribution so that um, um, usually most of your kind of traffic users, whatever you call it, will be driven by one major channel. And then there is a huge drop off to the second channel and then an even bigger drop off to the third channel. So usually companies in the early stage, even up to 100 million, are driven on one particular channel where the majority of the users coming from. And uh, you need, ideally, you want to figure out this channel before you even launch the product so you can just double down on it and then can they launch it. Um, yeah, and product channel feed can be your blessing and your, can, <clears throat> can your, be your demise because uh, there are a lot of uh, kind of let's say talk about um, uh, dating space, right? There are companies that were built around certain channels, specifically, for instance, when banner ads appeared, there was a magic.com which should leverage uh, banner channels very well and build a successful business. One search, uh, have uh, like Google search and uh, well, not only Google, but pre predominantly Google search ads, Google search appeared and like search optimization started gain traction. There is a company called Plenty of Fish that still I think around, but gained a lot of traction kind of based on new channels and social, uh, Zeus and then mobile, obviously Tinder. Uh, so okay, the, each of them essentially are doing the same thing, but they're leveraging different uh, channels and actually eating on the, on the market that was um, kind of done by the previous company. So that's why, and then I assume, I assume, I don't know actually if some of the previous company is still alive or not, but I assume they're kind of gave up a lot of market share when the next channel appeared and they didn't uh, have the capacity or hindsight, I don't know, well, not hindsight, but they didn't have um, understanding they need to jump on the channel. Um, yeah, so the good get gold, uh, the why that's important because all channels get killed off by the new channels that they appear. Additionally, what you need to be thinking about why the channel model channel and product channel fit is very important because there are two concepts that you will eventually, if everything is good, you will be most like operating. One is average annual revenue per customer or lifetime value per customer, doesn't matter how you call it. Uh, essentially how much revenue you generate from one customer. And then you have uh, another called SATS. Uh, it's a cost to acquire customer, of course, customer acquisition cost, doesn't matter, but like your SATS or CATS uh, to L LTV or IRPC, however you put it, ratio will be your main kind of driver on what most investors will be looking for on, on uh, most, uh, well, pretty much how you will be measuring your business um, uh, profitability and so on. So, kind of why, uh, since this is so important, it's very important to understand how uh, choosing the right channel in the beginning, depending on what kind of business you want to build, um, is so important because uh, the right channels that can, uh, that have like a high um, RPC to SAS ratio, and there are channels that have a uh, low RPC to ratio. So, so for instance, um, if you are um, if you are a social media company or planning to build a social media company, most of them are building their um, acquisition around viral or SEO, so search engine optimization, uh, either viral or SEO, uh, B2C, because virality is more or less free SEO if you don't do it right and if you have a good, um, specialist and experts in, in house and it's also more or less free so that's why acquiring users for uh, let's say Facebook and Pinterest well this is an older slide but uh, it's, it's essentially free that's why they can acquire them more or less for free and those users are not paying anything so they kind of the acquisition free and then um, um, the users are not generating revenue obviously they're generating revenue from this elsewhere on the other hand companies like uh, Netflix or Dropbox, they are relying heavily on SEO, uh, search engine marketing and display, but also SEO, especially Netflix nowadays. So, uh, but they also generate certain revenue. So, the average revenue per year, what is like $150 and on average, like 10 bucks, uh, 10 euros per month. So, yeah, they essentially, they usually the tolerance is like tolerance to like this RPC to SaaS is. Six to twelve months means how much, 
how fast you get your money back uh, from the revenue. So if you would say your uh, re yearly revenue is let's say $120 and you're willing to pay $60 to acquire the customer. So them, for them, it works, right? But then on the other hand, there is a higher VC, uh, high SaaS uh, for companies like Palantir, which is like data processing, um, data processing company, essentially, um, machine learning plus data processing company on Workday, which is huge enterprise um, workforce management software. The contracts are hundreds or even millions of dollars per year. Um, although they would uh, like to acquire everything from SEO and SEM and so on of B2B contents, most likely their customers are not uh, browsing uh, new companies to buy in Google. They most likely either do the uh, some kind of bidding uh, campaign or they need to be out. They usually are outreached by enterprise sales managers who essentially have the connections, have the entry uh, point to those companies they do uh, sales but obviously enterprise sales managers as salaries are not cheap and they're like going to 200 200 300 up to a million a year uh, in us and but for the companies that are selling those type of software which can run like a million or uh, so plus million a year uh, for the comp for one customer it is makes sense to pay such big salaries for enterprise sale so kind of the whole point here is that depending how much your revenue will be you can rely on a certain channels because otherwise the mathematics will not work and your neighbor would not be able to scale the the kind of problem here is a danger zone uh where you do not have enough revenue, but uh, your acquisition costs are too high. So for instance, you are running, I don't know, 200, 300 uh, revenue per year, maybe 500, but you're not able to produce, let's say content, which content is, uh, is uh, too expensive, uh, very expensive, and also do inbound sale because that's salaries of potentially initially a couple of managers, but potentially like tens of manager, if you are not able to match this revenue to, to your cost of acquisition, you will always be struggling to kind of drive profitability. And that's where usually companies die. So that's why choosing the right channel and, and kind of having the right model is very important in the, in the long run. Um, why? Because, well, too much friction there. Uh, and then uh, here, uh, if you don't have uh, the revenue, then you cannot afford it. So kind of, yeah, that's kind of my point here. So yeah, that's kind of the, I think the, all the slides for today. So my product market fit that I described in the first part, the second part, the model channel fit, uh, I can uh, maybe share afterwards a couple of links where you can read about the same thing in the more detail. Um, yeah, and we have roughly a couple of minutes for question. Um, we have, I think we have two in the chat first and then I will, I will take uh, hands. So Yanis asks, so now uh, it's very interesting time in the whole word question, what do you think? Uh, what is the main difference between product launch and grow now and before? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, is it about Microsoft Word? I think it's possible that Yanis has left this call because for me, his name shows grayed out. But uh, I think it's just about launching a product, how it was before uh, and how it was now like, I don't know, tens of years ago. Mm, I think nothing have changed. The only thing have changed is that the new frameworks and methodologies are appeared. That's the number one. The second one is with the um, kind of more and more companies that are focusing on the whole prototyping and like lean development and so on. It's now, um, so the, before that, there was no a big competition between digital products. Well, both digital and physical, to be honest, but uh, mostly we're talking about digital now, right? So before that, the whole, uh, because there weren't so many digital products, the whole concept of 
and build it and they will come was valid because well since there were not a lot of specialists a couple of companies who can jump early and build the product they would was most likely will sell because the market was unsaturated now uh building a uh, product became so easy like there are like 40 apps 40 new apps per month or something on there is a like crazy statistic so there are developers building new stuff all the time and now the prototyping and actually buildings and new stuff even without code is becoming easier so it's no longer about uh just building some stuff it's a building some stuff that actually delivers value in a meaningful way uh so uh kind of taking th this part that is much easier to build and also much easier to prototype uh everything shifted towards kind of if you have the idea test it as easily as cheaply as possible if it works then scale it crazy that's where the whole monetization and growth things come into place because if if you cannot scale then somebody else will do it uh, because everybody's doing the same thing somebody else will do it better right so it's about scaling fast um and you also can test uh, quite quickly so I think that's the main difference between now and I don't know 15 20 years ago um yeah more people are doing it bigger competition and everybody is doing it using like lean development approaches so somebody will eventually kind of figure it out uh willingness to pay I'm not sure what is this um yeah there is uh, I forgot what is the name of the framework was because it's too late but I will share the um I will I will I will uh, uh school price sensitivity model um, but maybe while while I'm looking I will uh somebody can ask a question so does anybody have any questions Oh, there is one uh, on the 19 channels for traction page. What does ASO stand for under existing platforms? It's App Store's uh, App Store optimization. This is similar to SEO as a search engine optimization, but it's App Store optimization. How do you optimize for bigger visibility on App Store? Uh, like for App Store, Google Play, those are most common ones, but like there are a lot of other platforms, like pretty much now every other bigger company, so they, since they understood that uh, they cannot solve for everything, they're building platforms for external developers to come in and solve for everything. So everything from Salesforce to, I don't know, Pipedrive, Salesforce and Pipedrive to, I don't know, Shopify, and I think in Amazon has some kind of, uh, but like pretty much take any big player in almost any space they want to build a platform uh, so they want to build uh, they want to be a platform and want to have an app store because they want developers to come in and build for additional use case for them and uh, they also want to be a center of ecosystem so they allow developers to come in and earn money on them but kind of they also want to be a gravitational center uh, to which all the developers come in but it doesn't mean that it's a bad way to start a business like for instance Printify where I work is we start with Shopify app but then eventually it pretty much became a self-sufficient business not relying on Shopify so much so you need to be smart about how to use it at the start and then kind of spin it off completely separately uh there are, I think two more questions yeah there's definitely at least another one who is the author for product channel model market framework where can uh, more information be found so i forgot uh, I, I actually used uh, you can look at this guy and he has um there you go this is the framework so brian barfor uh he used to be um uh head of growth at hubspot but now he's like a CEO of Reforge, the content, uh, like educational company. Um, so I can post a link here. The second part is mostly from him, well, with some, some small additions. Okay, uh, currently I don't see any more questions as of right now. 
Okay, I cannot find the framework. Um, I have used it like in three weeks ago and I forgot the name. Uh, but I will uh, maybe share it afterwards with you, Paul, and you can share it late, uh, later to everyone else. Yeah, definitely. Feel free to share it with me and then I will, uh, together with the recording or other links and information, I will share it with the participants. So do we, maybe we can take one final question if, uh, if there is one. Mm, I think no. Thank you, Diana. It was a pleasure. Okay, in that case. Uh, well, in that case, I want to give a huge thank you to Daniel, to you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, well, not tonight, this evening, and uh, being here and sharing your experience and knowledge with uh, everyone here. It was definitely insightful, and uh, you talked about quite a lot of topics, and I think uh, maybe a rewatch of the recording can also be helpful at some point. So, yeah, really a huge uh, thanks to you, and uh, I will write to you later, and then you, if you can share some useful links and so on, which you mentioned that you would. Cool, cool. Well, I hopefully uh, a lot of the new companies will come out of this, so good luck, everyone. I know it's, it's not easy, but uh, it's totally worth it. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Goodbye. And uh, yeah, as uh, as for the recording and the test, I will share the recording tomorrow. As for the test, either tomorrow or day day after, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I will share it on Slack. So uh, yeah, all the useful information, everything Daniel sends me, I will share it on Slack. So if you haven't yet registered, uh, please do that because that's where you will find all the useful uh, resources. So once more, thank you to Daniel and thanks to everyone who participated here this evening. And uh, yeah, see you on Slack and see you next Monday. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Have a nice one. Thank you. Bye-bye.